Okay, so now we begin applying the Buddhist toolkit to promote sustainable lifestyles, the case of Taiwan's humanistic Buddhists. So Taiwan um, really improved its environmental performance between 2005 and 2016. Um, it had the highest 10-year percentage improvement in Asia, about 27%, and went from next to the last into um, so the top 100 countries. Robert Weller identifies three pro-environmental social forces in Taiwan, the government, secular NGOs, and Taiwan's humanistic Buddhist groups. Lee and Han, in their 2022 article, um, show uh, by analyzing the Taiwan Social Change Survey data from 2000. 2009, that membership in Taiwan's humanistic Buddhist group strongly correlates with sustainable lifestyle practices, and they also find that Buddhist Siji Foundation has the most information on its website related to environmentalism, and Dharma Drum Mountain is second. So in my study, uh, my research question was, how did Buddhist Siji Foundation and Dharma Drum Mountain apply Buddhist signs, symbols, rituals, narratives, and practices to the problem of environmental degradation? And I gathered my data in a four-year multi-site ethnographic study of Siji and DDM in Taiwan and California. Of course, that's participant observation. I also did formal and informal interviews. Um, I got into the writing and videos by the founding masters and other group leaders. And then I analyzed religion as a to cultural toolkit, according to Anne Swidler's 1986 article, where she says that the, um, the signs and symbols then become tools that a society can use when faced with unsettled times to resolve social problems. Um, I further broke down culture into a composite of discourse systems, as suggested by Stalin, Stalin, and Jones in their 2012 book. And the discourse systems that I paid most attention to was the Buddhist discourse system, which are all these signs and symbols based on Buddhist texts and practices. Um, and because Taiwan is a modern East Asian society, I looked at the Confucian discourse system, which is based on Confucian text and philosophy, and the utilitarian discourse system based on enlightenment texts and philosophies, which is now the primary discourse system for international business and politics. So my field work sites were Buddhist Siji Foundation and Dharma Drum Mountain. Uh, Siji was founded by Master Jungian in 1966. It's a Buddhist NGO, but it contains a really strong core um, of Buddhist cultivation according to farming Chan traditions that were laid out by Chan Master Bai Zhang Bai Bai in uh, the Tang Dynasty. Dharma Drum Mountain was founded by Master Shenyan in 1989 with a mission to uplift human character and build a pure land on earth, and this is accomplished through education. As a Buddhist religious group, the focus is on Chan meditation and sutra study, and then the members are encouraged to go out and serve society by spreading the calm and wisdom that they've gained in their inner cultivation. And the group does have an affiliated NGO that gives members, especially those in Taipei, opportunities to serve, and that is the Dharma Drum Humanities and Social Improvement Foundation, or HSIF. Now, the really interesting thing about I, these humanistic Buddhist groups is that they blur the line between the sacred and the mundane. I found this particularly in my uh, research and um, Stefania Trevognan and Stuart Chandler found the same thing, that they bring the sacred into cultivation so that even the way you deal with your trash uh, becomes an object of Buddhist practice. So I characterize them as pietistic Buddhist groups. And I believe that this emphasis on bringing the sacred cultivation of Buddhism into the believers' daily lives then allows them to impact how the believers live. So tool number one from the Buddhist discourse system that I found are the bodhisattva precepts and applying them to all the believers. So this is how they bring the sacred into the believers' um, lives. 
Now, the first one to talk about this that I found was Venerable Ing Shun in his book, The Way to Buddhahood, where he says that if you're a human who wants to attain Buddhahood, you should keep the five precepts and the 10 good deeds in constant focus. And this then makes you a novice bodhisattva at the beginning stages of the bodhisattva path. Master Zheng Yin also talks about this throughout her prolific ministry. Um, one quote, she says, to enter the world of Siji is to embark on the journey of the Bodhisattvas. Now, Master Zheng Yin, as a monk, the first modern monk with a PhD in Buddhist studies, did a, an academic study of the Vinaya and paid particular attention to all of the texts that talked about the Bodhisattva precepts. And his conclusion was that these precepts can be maintained by anyone, therefore, everyone, all Buddhist practitioners should receive the Bodhisattva precepts and practice them life after life. Tool number two is a goal of creating a pure land on earth in the human realm. And this actually started with Venerable Taishu, who is credited as the founding monk of the humanistic Buddhist movement. I don't say organization because it's a coalition of many organizations. And Taishu felt that the Buddhists should create a pure land in the human realm through their personal cultivation, their outreach to uplift society by moral education, and their service to the suffering beings around them. Now, he didn't tie this in with environmentalism, he believed that science and technology uh, in the modern age would help create the pure land. Ying Xuan then built on this and he said, all the Buddha lands, Sukhavati, um, the medicine Buddha's pure land, all of the Mahayana Buddhas that have pure lands started out with a human land that was suffering. And then by their vows and their constant practice, life after life and their cultivation, their land, a suffering human land, eventually became a pure land. So he concludes that the pure land in this current realm will be the achievement of a communitarian action carried out by Buddha, Bodhisattvas, and human beings. So they didn't, uh, these important founding leaders of the humanistic Buddhist movement didn't talk about environmentalism, but they laid that foundation. And so we see that Master Sheng Yin with his little mission statement um, includes preserving and protecting the natural environment as part of building a pure land on earth. And Master Zheng Yin in her first statement when she calls her volunteer followers to, um, pick up the trash that was a big problem at the time. She says Taiwan should be a pure land. So purify Taiwan by cleaning up the trash. And this then brings us to the third tool in the toolkit, which is responding appropriately to the causes and conditions of Taiwan, which was being called Garbage Island in the late 1980s and 1990s, because it's economic miracle, it's rapid industrialization and shift from an agrarian to a modern industrialized economy, tripled the production of non-biodegradable garbage. The island is very small. It's only about the size of Rhode Island and the dumps could not accommodate the garbage. So there was dumping all over the place. That's a picture from 1993, which is why the resolution isn't so great. But there were piles of garbage all over. Um, there were garbage wars where residents said no dump by us. Uh, there was air pollution, soil and water contamination. It was a mess. So. Master Zheng Yin put out her call in 1990, and the Tsuji volunteers responded by beginning recycling programs. And then as climate change became a problem, they expanded the environmental mission to include preserving water, also to include uh, veganism to mitigate climate change, and the recycling work still goes on. So in, 19, in 2019, Kazer and her tell us that Tsuji recaptured a total of 81 million kilograms of recyclable items out of Taiwan's waste stream. They had environmental protection stations with education, and they also make products out of recycled waste. And another thing that they do that um, my people in the street interviewees said was helpful was they have community environmental protection points where on days that the government doesn't collect recyclables, the city volunteers will take them from, from their neighbors. Um, 
Shen Yin named 1992 an environmental protection year. And his organization, of course, is a religious organization. So he was like, purify your hearts, reduce your greed and your desire to um, consume, and then go out and improve society. And he implemented green practices like reduce, reuse, recycle. That was his first way of telling people to protect the environment. In 1992, he added in um, educational components about environmentalism to all of the programs through HSIF. He developed numerous green religious rituals, such as organic burial. Those are his monastic disciples carrying his ashes for an organic burial after he passed away. And then he encouraged individual members to support environmentalism by volunteering with government or community groups if they did not live in areas where they could work with HSIF. Now, another way that this interconnection of all things in Buddhism gets applied is the way that the teachings, practices, and behavioral norms to protect the environment get thoroughly wrapped up in these institutions so that you can't escape environmentalism. Right, so Siji has the environmental mission. It's well known for its environmental activities, but in its medical mission, the hospitals also practice environmentalism by working with Taiwan's government to develop ways to recycle plastic medical waste. Um, P, the children in Siji schools all learn about environmentalism and the environmental protection stations hold classes for school children in all schools in Taiwan if they want them. In disaster relief, the blankets and clothing that are handed out are made from recycled bottles. And then they have this handy dandy little sheet of behaviors and norms that you should do to live sustainably that the volunteers first practice themselves and then share with their communities. Now in DDM, because it's a religious instead of an NGO, again, we have the teachings, calm the greed, get rid of the desires, and then practice. And the monasteries are very strict about their uh, sustainable practices within the monastery. So when the believers go for seven-day or 14-day Chan retreats, they're forced to live sustainably. And many said that was when they started changing their lifestyles. Um, all of the rituals, the Fahwe, other rituals within the monastery, and temples, no incense except for a little tiny bit in a communal censer, no jaw sticks. Um, if you're praying for people, no paper, no carved bamboo, little plaques. Everything is in the cloud and projected onto the walls. Um, all of the classes that I attended, Buddhist studies and meditation, had some component where you were encouraged to protect the natural environment. And the behavioral norms that get taught in the classes and modeled by their volunteers are very very similar to those on Siji's sheet. So the final tool is upaya, or skillful means. And it, both groups are really good at framing their discourse to match diverse audiences. And I used Siji as an example because I was able to attend three environmental outreach programs in the same month. Um, the first is pictured on the lower uh, left, a performance of the Filial Piety Sutra that included school children from nine schools in the city of Taidong. And because it was children and then their families in the audience, the way that environmentalism was presented really resonated most strongly with the Confucian discourse system. Um, the two upper pictures are from a Taipei community tea in Beitou. Um, and the people who went there were highly educated urbanites. They were interested in learning to cook vegetarian food. And they also then learned that going vegan could help mitigate climate change, which is a big problem in Taipei. So because they were more highly educated, they could understand the science behind climate change, and it was mainly framed in the utilitarian discourse system, not too much about Buddhism or worship or whatever. Um, and then in Hualien, which is in a rural area, I went to a community center where there was a Buddhist ritual, a skit promoting veganism, and then a vegan potluck. And the ritual was done without burning incense and without killing animals. And they were encouraging their neighbors to stop sacrificing animals and burning incense to protect the environment and then to go vegan for their health. Nothing said about climate change because the people here were less well-educated. 
So both Siji and DDM avoid partisan politics. They cooperate with the government, but they don't get involved in public policy. And some people think, well, if they don't get involved with public policy, how can they help? But if we look at Gorsky's study of how early modern Lutheran pietists in Prussia had this grassroots discipline from below that helped the government change the society from an agrarian one to an early modern industrial society, I think we can apply the same kind of logic because the emphasis on the Bodhisattva precepts means that Taiwan humanistic Buddhists also have this grassroots discipline from below. And when they go out and talk to their neighbors, they're spreading environmentalism as a sacred moral act. And that um, makes it you know, more powerful in terms of their discourse and may be able to get people to change their lifestyles better. So thank you for your attention. I need to thank Taiwan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs for subsidizing uh, the majority of my research in Taiwan with the MOFA Taiwan Fellowship.